Welcome back to Intro to Religion, PHL 1030. We are going over Tim Bain's book, Philosophy of Religion, a very short introduction. So we are continuing to go over chapter 3, which is about arguments for the existence of God. And in this video, we're going over the argument from religious experience. So the question that we'll be going over is for exam 1, part A, question number 5 which is as follows, which of the objections to William Alston's position do you find stronger and which do you find weaker? Why? So pages 45 to 50 is where you're going to find that information. So the argument from religious experience, William Alston, a philosopher, lived from 1921 to 2009, and his basic idea is that an inner religious experience has the same value as evidence for the existence of God as an outward sense perception. So if you saw a miracle, if you saw someone walking on water and, and that person claimed, I'm doing this by the power of God, that would be evidence for God. Similarly, if you have some kind of life transforming inner emotional intellectual experience, because you experienced it directly, it's the same as experiencing something outward directly. So religious experiences are evidence for the existence of God, says William Alston. So there are objections to that. And which of them do you find stronger? Which do you find weaker? But before we get into the details, let's just see how uh, Tim Bain introduces this part of chapter three. And he introduces it with Blaise Pascal. So 1623 to 1662, famous French mathematician and theologian. He wrote a book called Pensées or Thoughts. But as much as Pascal believed in God and as keen as his intellect was in looking for evidence of God in the cosmos, he didn't think that those kinds of arguments would really have much weight in people's lives. So here's what Blaise Pascal said. He says... Uh, the alleged proofs of God's existence are so remote from human reasoning and so involved that they make little impact, and even if they did help some people, it would only be for a moment during which they watched the demonstration, because an hour later they would be afraid that they had made a mistake. So the intellectual proofs for the existence of God, they might help some people for a little while, but they tend to evaporate under the, the sun of daily life. But what doesn't seem to evaporate is powerful inner emotional experiences. And Blaise Pascal, Tim Bain goes on to comment on page 44, seems to have had at least one of those kinds of experiences. I'm sure he did. Uh, after his death, a piece of parchment that had been sewn into his coat was discovered on which was inscribed a record of an event that had occurred to him on the evening of 23 November 1654 with the words, Fire, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, not of philosophers and scholars. So Blaise Pascal was a philosopher. He did develop powerful intellectual arguments for why you should believe in God, such as Pascal's wager. You've got everything to win and nothing to lose in comparison to eternal bliss, so you should wager that God exists. That was his famous argument for why you should believe. But... He himself said those kinds of arguments aren't really going to convince anybody. Inner experiences are what really counts. And so here's what Tim Bain says. A recent survey of Americans found that nearly half of all respondents, 49%, claim to have had a moment of sudden religious insight or awakening. So almost half of all people in the United States of America have had some kind of a religious experience. And 30% of those had no religious affiliation. So it doesn't mean that you have to belong to any particular religion of the world to have experienced some kind of inward religious experience or spiritual experience. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to William Alston's argument who says, uh, those who have religious experiences, Alston claims, typically take God to have been presented to their consciousness, quote, 
in generically the same way as that in which objects in the environment are presented to one's consciousness in sense perception. So inward emotional experience of God is an experience. So is a sense perception an experience. If you see someone walking on water, oh, wow, that's a miracle. That must be due to God or, or some kind of a supernatural power. Similarly, if you've experienced God inwardly, then that's as trustworthy as your sense perception, says Alston. So what are the objections to that? One ob obvious objection is, well, yeah, but if someone's walking on water, then a lot of different people can verify that. But only I can verify that I had a religious experience. It's not open for, for verification by other witnesses. So that's one obvious difference. And Tim Bain will talk about that. But here... Um, so, but before I get into the objections, this final word uh, summarizing Alston's position is that um, we are justified in taking religious experiences at face value unless we have reason to think that we are being misled in some way. So innocent until proven guilty. We should believe your, what you see unless you have a reason to think that you're being deceived. And similarly, you should believe what you experience inwardly unless you have a reason to think you've been deceived. So here's the objections. Objections to Olson's position can be divided into two classes. This is page 45. One sort of objection holds that there are crucial differences between religious experiences and ordinary perceptual experiences, such that religious experience shouldn't be regarded as a form of perceptual experience. Okay, so obviously you can experience something inwardly that others can't perceive, but we can all perceive the things that we see outwardly. Another kind of objection holds that even if religious experiences qualify as a kind of perceptual experience, they lack the epistemic status that standard perceptual experiences enjoy. So, epistemic status. Epistemology is the study of knowledge and how we acquire knowledge and what qualifies as valid knowledge. So, sense perceptions qualify as valid knowledge because you can have it confirmed by others and you can, well, I think that's the main reason. You can have it confirmed by others because if you have an inner experience, to you it is the same as an outward experience, except that others can't say, yeah, you're right, I saw the same thing. So there's always room for doubt. Am I just imagining, you know, I know I had an experience, but did I just conjure that out of some neurotic need, some fear of death, some need for a father figure, like Freud would say, Maybe I had some other motivation for dreaming up this experience, whereas you've got a pretty good reason to think, you know, oh, here, here's this pen. I'm not dreaming it up. It's right here. And if someone else was to come in the room, I could ask, do you see this red pen? And they would probably say yes. But if they came in the room and, and I said, did you see, did you experience my inner religious experience this morning? They would say, no, I didn't. All right, so the epistemic status. All right, so now let's go in to the details. So the first one is that religious experiences aren't the same as outward sense perceptions. And here is his example of the president of Tajikistan. So you go to a dinner party and you see the president of Tajikistan. So he, he's going to make a difference between seeing someone if you saw the president of Tajikistan and you didn't know it was the president, yeah, you would have seen him, but you wouldn't know, you wouldn't have seen the president as the president of Tajikistan. You would have just seen him as a regular guy. You have no reason, nothing in that visual experience gives you reason to believe that he was the president. Similarly, if you have an inner religious experience of God, you very might have, it very might be the case that you did experience God, but what is it about that experience that indicates it was actually God? Can you experience God as the creator of the universe? He will go on to say, but first we'll go on to his, I'll just read what he says about the president of Tajikistan. So he says, suppose that you are at a party and you happen to see the president of Tajikistan help himself to a glass of champagne. Although the person that you see is the president of Tajikistan, you don't see him as the president of Tajikistan. Your experience is an experience of the president of Tajikistan because there's nothing in your visual experience that reveals him as this president of another country. 
someone else would have to tell you, oh yeah, by the way, that's the president of Tajikistan. So similarly, the objection runs. Even if your experience is an experience of God, there's nothing in your experience itself that reveals the identity of its object. You ex your experience is an experience of God as God. All right, your experience is not an experience of God as God. In order for your religious experience to be an experience of God as such, the argument continues, you would need to be able to experience God as having those properties that are essential to God's nature, such as being the creator of the world. Okay, therefore, when you have an inner religious experience, oh, I was down, way down in life, and I felt like there was no meaning in life, and I prayed to God, please help me, and then suddenly it was as if a sun rose in my, in my heart and all the doubts and shadows fled away, and it was this overwhelming experience, and I was crying, powerful, transformative experience. Okay, well, what in that experience proves to you that it was God? If God is understood as the omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, all-good creator of the world, was there any experience of the creation of the world in your emotional uplifting experience? So he'll go on to say, what should we make of this obje objection? Should we certainly, we should certainly grant that many of the properties that theists take to be essential to God's nature cannot be experienced. One cannot experience God as the creator of the cosmos, nor can one experience God as unlimited in knowledge, power, and goodness. So I'll say, for one thing, I think you can experience God with those characteristics, most especially in near-death experiences, which are religious experiences. I'll come back to that, but let me continue here on page 46. One cannot experience God as the creator of the cosmos, okay, but the objection overlooks the fact that God might have other distinctive properties that are perhaps experientially detectable. Time and again, those who have religious experiences describe the object of their experiences wholly awesome and transcendent. It is presumably these aspects of their religious experience what Rudolf Otto describes as their noumenal aspects, which explains why so many individuals are convinced that their experiences are experiences of God. Okay, so Tim Bain is saying, you don't experience God as the omnipotent creator of the cosmos, but still you ex experience God as awesome and transcendent and holy. Uh, so that still might qualify as an experience of God. But I would say when most people ex experience God as awesome, that entails, if you experience God as the creator of the cosmos, that would be experiencing God as awesome. And similarly, this numinous experience of God. So numinous comes from the word noumena, as opposed to the word phenomena. Phenomena is that which you can perceive with your sense perceptions, with your five sense organs, outward ex perceptions, which you can see, smell, touch, taste, and hear. Noumena is a word that became popular with Immanuel Kant, the thing in itself. I can see this pen because it's being filtered through to my mind through these categories of thought. What is this pen before I perceive it? What is it in itself? That's called noumena. And Kant said, there's no way for you to know. You can only know it as it appears to you. The thing in itself, the noumena, is some mysterious entity. So this God is a numinous entity. Noumena meaning it's not something you can perceive with your sense organs, but it has this mysterious quality of existence without being able to be perceived. At any rate, Tim Bain seems to say, well... Holiness, awesomeness, and transcendence, those are believable. People experience those things, and those are attributes of God. And, and I just think it's kind of a false dichotomy. You can't experience God as the omnipotent, all-power, all-good, all-knowing, omnipresent God, but you can experience God as holy, awesome, and transcendent. They're, they seem more or less synonymous. I guess you could be holy, awesome, and transcendent without being infinitely holy, awesome, and transcendent. But at any rate, it's a subtle point. But can you experience God as the creator of the cosmos? During near-death experiences, that's what people claim that they do experience. I've talked about this before. One of the most frequently cited 
recollections people have when their heart stops they have this out of body experience and then they come back they say it seemed to me as if i was rising above my body literally looking down from above at the ceiling and then rising above the building i was in or if you were outside just rising above the scene to the outer atmosphere until you're accelerating or i felt myself accelerating through space faster and faster until it seemed to me as if i was traveling through a dark tunnel toward a infinite point of all loving light that knew everything it was all embracing and it was god so relativity theory says that if you could travel near the speed of light you would experience all of the light in the cosmos even to the light directly behind you get pulled into a single point at the end of a dark tunnel and that point of light would contain all space and time it would be the gravitational singularity that gave birth to the cosmos which has most of the attributes of god it's omnipotent because it's infinitely dense it's infinitely powerful it's omnipresent because it contains all space and time and it's omniscient because it contains all space and time it contains all the information describing the past present and future is it all good well the mathematical description of the gravitational singularity doesn't say anything about being all good or personal in any way but when you compare that mathematical description derived from physics to these religious experiences and you see these very precise parallels i think that can count as evidence for the validity of both these light at the end of the tunnel experience described by near-death experiences and described by general relativity and special relativity the fact that they're so closely paralleling each other seems to me valuable for natural theology and it seems to me to lend scientific credence to these near-death experiences which people come back from fully believing in god when they didn't before and so i would say that it is possible to experience god as the omnipotent omnipresent omnibenevolent omniscient creator of the world if when people experience that light at the end of the tunnel they're experiencing the source of all space and time it, it's what they claim and it's repeatedly claimed everyone has heard light at the end of the tunnel it's it's a part of the english language at this point okay so continuing now on page 46 tim bain says a second in my view more serious objection to the view that religious experiences might qualify as perceptual concerns uh, that religious experiences might qualify as perceptual concerns the fact that perception involves a kind of causal sensitivity to an object and its properties so he says if you change the color of this book people would experience it differently in predictable ways so causal sensitivity is already going to be a problem i think uh, for tim bain because tim bain likes to cite david hume as someone who for example on page 40 he says a third reason to doubt whether fine-tuning facts could justify the hypothesis of an intelligent designer is in my view much more weighty indeed i regard this objection as one of the most profound in all of the philosophy of religion the objection has its roots in a question posed by david hume why should we not suppose an animal body to be the, to be ordered and organized originally of itself or from unknown causes then in supposing a mind to be ordered in that way so we talked about that, that in the previous video david hume says just because you see order in material things doesn't imply that that order must have derived from some ordered mind why not rather assume that the order is just inherent in matter and that the mind copies that order it sees it and it and it reproduces it in its memory i only point to david hume because david hume who tim bain goes on to quote again with one of the arguments about why even if we do assume there's a creator of the cosmos why should we assume it's the god of the bible why couldn't it be some young baby god or an old doting god he's saying and so if you're going to appeal to david hume as providing one of the most powerful arguments against intelligent design 
Well then, I would point to David Hume and say he didn't believe in causality. So coming back to this idea of religious experiences serving as evidence for the existence of God, what, it, what Tim Bain is saying is that they lack this ability for this causal sensitivity is what he's going to describe this as. So uh, if the orientation, so for an example, on page 47, if the orientation or color of this book were to change, then your visual experience of it would also change in predictable ways. It is this causal sensitivity that lies at the basis of perception's evidential role. Thus, if religious experiences are perceptual experiences, then they too must exhibit this kind of causal sensitivity. But the objection continues, it is unclear how they could exhibit causal sensitivity given that God is not spatially located. Okay, I like this, uh, that he reduces it to that. How can God cause anything given that God is not spatially located. So this is an issue that Princess Elizabeth brought up to Rene Descartes, who defined consciousness as unextended thinking substance, and he defined matter as unthinking substance extended in space. So Princess Elizabeth said, well, if your mind is not extended in space and your body is, where's the contact point? How can your mind tell your body what to do? And how can things like fire touching your body communicate pain to your mind. If the mind has no extension in space, where do they meet? Where do they touch? There's no touching point. There's no ability for the one to cause anything to happen to the other. So that is, seems to me to be what Tim Bain is pointing out, this causal sensitivity. How could God cause anything? He says, after all, other non-spatial entities, such as numbers and propositions, are not possible objects of perceptual experience, in part precisely because we cannot be causally related to them. You can perceive representations of numbers, that is numerals, but you cannot perceive numbers themselves. So, Alston denies that there is any real difficulty here, arguing that because God is the causal ground of everything that occurs, it follows that God can cause religious experiences. Okay, so he's going to get into the Big Bang here, which warrants me bringing the idea of the gravitational singularity into this discussion. So I'll continue here on 47. However, it is not clear whether this response is fully convincing, for even if we grant that God is the causal ground of all that exists, God's causal contribution to religious experiences might fail to be the kind of causal contribution that is required by the causal condition on perception. All right, God can create everything, fine, but can God cause you to have perceptions that are valid. So as the philosopher Nick Zangwill has pointed out, the Big Bang is in some sense a cause of your current visual experiences. If the Big Bang hadn't occurred, then you wouldn't exist. But it hardly follows that you can perceive the Big Bang. Zangwill's point is that perception requires more than a but-for cause. I would have existed but for the Big Bang. And thus, the fact that God might be a but-for cause of religious experiences fails to show that religious experiences can meet the causal constraint on perception. Okay, so God is not spatially located in the same way that numbers are not spatially located. So the number six as an idea exists, but you can't perceive the idea of six. You can perceive the shape of six, and it's shaped differently in different languages and throughout history. You can see perception, uh, representations of the number six or any other number, but you can't see it itself. This is similar to Plato's theory of the absolute ideas existing in the idea of the good, the ultimate idea of the good, which St. Augustine equated with God's mind. So the ideas in God's mind, these absolute perfect ideas of everything that exists, they can't be perceived directly although they can if you open the eye of the soul, says Plato. According to Plato, you're made of the ideas of God's mind. You don't see them outside of yourself. You are made of them. Everyone is a part and parcel of the absolute supreme God, so everyone is made of all the same ingredients of God. Everyone is imbued with all of the same ideas that God has. That's Plato's theory of the absolute ideas imprinted on the soul. 
So, I want to point here to this idea of God not being spatially located and therefore not having the ability to cause a, a experience that qualifies as evidence for the existence of God. So, I think, well, I wrote a book called Cosmos and Psyche, where I equate the psyche or the soul with the gravitational singularity, not cosmos and psyche. That was a book written by Richard Tardis. Mine is called uh, Psyche and Singularity. I was, I've got a copy of Cosmos and Psyche over here, which I love. So Psyche and Singularity. I equate the soul with the gravitational singularity. And the Big Bang is the source of all space and time. It's a gravitational singularity. That's the Big Bang. Everything came from a point of infinite density with no extension in space. You cannot perceive the gravitational singularity, but you can perceive its effects. In a black hole, you can't see it because space-time is contracting toward it at the speed of light at the event horizon, so no light can get out. You can't see it, but you can see other planets or stars or clouds of gas. Whole stars will orbit around black holes. We, that's been verified in the center of our own galaxy. Stars were tracked as they orbited some invisible point. Nothing was there, yet they're orbiting around it. It would have to be some enormous amount of gravity, which you can't see, so they assume it must be a singularity inside a supermassive black hole. So, if seeing the effects of the, the gravitational effects of a singularity will warrant belief in its existence, is it possible to see the effects of the idea of God as warranting belief in the existence of God. You can see suns make orbits around an invisible point or where there's nothing there. So what would be the equivalent in human behavior? I mean, you see people orbiting around the particular religious beliefs, you know, all the different religions of the world. People seem to be instinctively inclined towards organizing their lives around these absolute ideas so at any rate i'm bringing up in this introductory class I, I can't dwell on it for too long but the fact that tim bain brings up the idea of proving god's existence and he compares it to proving the existence of the big bang he believes in the big bang you can assume therefore that it must have come from a singularity even though you can't see the big bang he's saying although even there you you can't see the big bang directly but you can see it's echo, the cosmic microwave background radiation. So I'm just going to bring up that point for his, his major point is that God's not spatially located so that God can't cause you to have certain kinds of experiences in the way that normal sense perceptions can. And so by pointing out that non-extended nature of God, non his lack of spatial extension, it just seems the parallels with the gravitational singularity are important to look at. All right, so, and again, when people have these near-death experiences, they say that they're shooting through this dark tunnel toward this point of all loving light, and that their whole life passes before their eyes, and that a lot of people say when they get there, they feel like they're at the edge of the cosmos. If they went any further, they wouldn't get back into their body, and they feel like they're experiencing the past, the present, and the future of the whole cosmos simultaneously. So these near-death experiences are very powerful. And the fact that he didn't mention near-death experiences in the part of the chapter where he's talking about the argument from religious experience seems to be a, an oversight. Okay, so continuing here on page 47. Let us assume, if only for the sake of argument, that religious experiences qualify as perceptual states. Might they inherit the epistemic status of perceptual states and thus justify beliefs in the way that perceptual experiences can? At least three reasons have been given for answering the question in the negative. So this whole video, we're going over question number five in part A, which says, which of the objections to William Alston's positions do you find stronger and which do you find weaker? So these are all the different objections. So we went from the objections to, to the claim that religious inner inner religious experiences are equivalent to outer sense perceptions or perceptual experiences we went over his 
objections to that. And they're not just Tim Bain's objections. He's just analyzing various objections. So now the second slew of objections is about the epistemic value, the epistemic status of perceptual states. Epistemic meaning, so epistemology is the study of knowledge and how we acquire knowledge, what qualifies as knowledge. So epistemic status says, all right, you had a religious experience, but how do we know how much knowledge that can really give you about the nature of God? What, what can that really, the experience is real, but what does it indicate about God? What's valid and what isn't? So the first reason concerns experiences of God's absence. So some people are saying, okay, if an inner experience of God is evidence that God exists, then the lack of an inner experience of God is evidence that God doesn't exist. And a lot more people, well, actually 49% of Americans have had religious experience. Well, 51% say they haven't. So the majority hasn't. Therefore, doesn't that outweigh the evidence in favor of it? And Tim Bain says, no, it's, that's not a good argument because if you see a friend in a crowd, Sure, that's evidence that the friend is there. But if you don't see the friend in the crowd, that's not necessarily evidence that the friend's not there. It might be a huge crowd, so the chances of you spotting your friend out of a, you know, 10,000 people it doesn't prove that your friend wasn't there. So lower on 48, he says, a second reason to deny that religious experiences have the same epistemic status as ordinary perceptual experiences involves the claim that the epistemic status of perception depends on a grasp of the conditions under which perceptual experiences are trustworthy. So he uses vision as an example. We know what the conditions for good vision are. You have to have, the area must be well lit and your eyes have to be in good condition. You can't be too sleepy. So similarly, what are the conditions that make that warrants belief in religious experiences. So, the nature of this problem, he says on page 49, can be appreciated by considering drug-induced experiences. We know that drug-induced visual experiences are not to be trusted, but what about drug-induced religious experiences? Are the religious experiences that are triggered by ingesting psychedelics less trustworthy than those that occur in the absence of drugs? How would one tell? Perhaps drug-induced religious experiences are more trustworthy. Skipping down a little bit, the fundamental problem here is that of our ability to, to distinguish trustworthy experiences from untrustworthy ones depends on our capacity to locate experiences within the causal structure of the world. And for reasons that we have already noted, it is not clear how religious experiences can be so located. So what are the conditions for trusting a religious experience? And the example is, what about psychedelic drugs? Because people who take psychedelic drugs have notoriously or famously said, I ex had a religious experience induced by these drugs. Well, should we disregard that evidence because it was triggered by a drug? Or rather, should we take it more seriously? Uh, for example, Stanislav Grof, who I write about in my book, and I took a class with him in my PhD for philosophy and religion at the California Institute of Integral Studies. He was the last licensed psychiatrist, so a medical doctor in psychiatry, the last one to have a license to use psychedelic drugs legally and he gave the last experiment was giving psychedelic mushrooms to terminal cancer patients to help them deal with the fear of death they have just subsequently allowed not recently they have been giving more people licenses to use psychedelic drugs again but the last one until it was just recently re-legalized in certain situations was in america was stanislav Grof, and he gave a lot of people a lot of psychedelic drugs, LSD-25 and, and psilocybin, the psychedelic mushrooms, and the people would have religious experiences, predictably. And so the question is, are those religious experiences invalid because they're induced by a drug, or are they more trustworthy? And Stanislav Graf would say, well, whether they're more or less trustworthy, they are trustworthy. And he looks at psychedelic drugs like a telescope into the soul. 
And he also pointed out that under the influence of psychedelic drugs, people have very similar experiences as the near-death experience. So the religious experiences people have with psychedelics closely parallel the religious experiences people have when their heart stops and then they are resuscitated. This whole, and Stan, Stanislav Grof himself, his first LSD experience under was in a laboratory under doing an experiment right after he got his medical doctor license and he felt himself shoot out to the edge of the cosmos where he said he felt like he experienced the big bang and he became one with the cosmos so i think it has a lot to say about the evidence the epistemic value of religious experiences i think especially when we include near-death experiences and compare them to 20th century cosmology and the evidence derived from psychedelic experiments that I think that lends credence to these kinds of experiences, to these religious experiences, whether they're induced by psychedelic drugs, near-death experiences, or just a life of prayer. A lot of people have similar experiences, and that brings us to... Um, and also, let me just say one thing about the causal structure of the world. So this is Tim Bain saying, how could a, a God who's not located in space cause anything to happen? And I mentioned David Hume before. David Hume doesn't believe in causality because you can't perceive it with your five sense organs. This happens and then that happens. So you can predict you know, every time I drop, let go of the pen, it falls. I've done it a thousand times. I can assume that it will probably fall on the thousand and first time, but I can't know that for sure. I have no absolute reason to know that that will happen based on some kind of a universal idea of the way things work. It's just based on my sense perceptions. I've seen it happen in the past. It will probably happen that way in the future. So he didn't believe in cause and effect and... Tim Bain, however, is pointing to the inability of religious experiences to serve as evidence for the existence of God because it's not clear how they could cause that kind of truth to be had. Where's the causal connecting point? So if you're going to point out David Hume as this uh, great champion of skepticism, well, then I would bring him back in and say this whole idea of a mind-independent, objective world that obeys the laws of cause and effect is something that David Hume rejected entirely. And, and I'll come back to that again. But first, at the bottom of page 49, Tim Bain goes on to examine the third reason to be skeptical about the epistemic value of religious experiences for proving the existence of God. So it helps that I'm making these videos because it's kind of dense material. And if you've read it and you're listening, this should help you. If you're just watching this for entertainment, I'm sure you've already tuned this one out. But the bottom of page 49, let us consider one final challenge to the argument from religious experience. The challenge from religious pluralism. So here's the basic point is all the different religions vary. None of them agree on everything. So that makes it seem less likely that any one of them is true. So I'll read what he says. As the critic Michael Martin has put it, religious experiences in one culture often conflict with those in another. One cannot accept all of them as veridical, yet there does not seem to be a way to separate the veridical experiences from the rest. So, as an analogy on page 50, Tim Bain says, consider a world in which the visual experiences of one group of people were starkly at odds with those of another group, so that intersubjective agreement about how to describe the objects of sight was rare, if not altogether absent. In such a world, one might well doubt whether visual experience was a form of contact with an objective, mind-independent world, as, as opposed to a mere play of subjective impressions. Okay, well... Tim Bain's hero, David Hume, did not believe in an objective, mind-independent world. He believed it was a play of subjective impressions, habits, relations of ideas, which include space, time, and cause and effect. That what we actually experience, and this is what Buddhists say as well, 
is a constant flux of different sense perceptions, none of which are connected in any fundamental way. And inwardly, what we experience is the same thing. Sense perceptions, that's all we ever experience. That there's an objective world correlating to those sense perceptions is not provable, says David Hume. All we experience are experiences themselves. Sense perceptions and emotions, and they're always changing. They're never the same from one moment to the next, so there is no self underlying them all. The idea of a self is itself an illusion built up by assuming that our memories reflect some ground of, that holds them all together and endures through, through time. So, so that is, I'm just pointing that out because we do have reason to doubt our visual experiences represent a mind independent world. Quantum mechanics gives us reason to doubt that as well. And he mentions quantum mechanics, um, how it might make uh, the idea of cause and effect seem unlikely. And he's, so he, he might have brought that uh, into this argument. So the entire idea of an objective world existing independently of the mind is one that he questions earlier, and he brings it in here as an analogy to show that religious experiences are similarly not to be trusted. If you can't get two groups of people to describe a physical object in the same way, it'll make you doubt whether physical objects even exist. And similarly, if you can't get two different religious groups to define God in exactly the same way, it makes you doubt that God actually exists. So, and I'm saying that, first of all, the outward objectively existing world has been more or less disproven, in my opinion, by 20th century physics, which says that objects, little particles of which objects are supposedly made, they don't exist as particles unless they're being observed. They exist in waves of probability until they're being observed. So that complicates the whole issue here. And in this short introduction, I think I've broached the basic issues that you can decide how you want to answer this question yourself, but I'm going to go on to this next paragraph. This is surely one of the most powerful objections to the argument from religious experience. Some theorists respond to it by suggesting that the conflict between religious experience is merely, su is merely superficial and that underlying the obvious disagreement is a set of core contents that is common to all religious experiences. So, there are differences between the religious experiences, but underlying them, there are common archetypes that reappear. Carl Jung, the famous psychologist, would say that. Tim Bain goes on to say, yeah, but some religions experience God in starkly personal terms, others in just as stark impersonal terms, such as Buddhism. So how can you find commonalities underlying both of those? Well, you can. I mean, Hinduism... The monotheistic versions of it believe in reincarnation, so does Buddhism. Um, but the idea that why, if God exists, how come no two religions describe God in the same way? It's a valid point. It makes it, it's a good reason to be skeptical about the ability to learn anything certain about God when no two religions, and, and if you really get intense about it, probably no two people have ever had exactly the same understanding of God. And does that mean that there's no God? Um, me personally, I don't think it does, but I can see how you might think that it does provide reasons for extra skepticism. Okay, so the question that we went over is, question five, part A, which of the objections to William Alston's position do you find stronger and which do you find weaker and why? All right, so to help you with this exam, we're going to very briefly go over them all. And then we'll end this video, which I knew was going to be a long one. So the whole argument starts on page 43, Arguments from Religious Experience. And I'll go right to William Alston, who says that our experiences inward, our inward religious experiences of God are basically the same as our outward experiences of sense objects, and that we should trust them unless we have a reason to not trust them, that they're innocent unless proven guilty. So, Alston, I mean, Tim Bain says that the objections to that claim by Alston, 
can be broken down into two basic classes. One is the difference between inner religious experience and outward perceptual experiences or sense perceptions. And two is about the epistemic status of religious experiences. Even if you say religious inner experiences are equivalent to outward sense perceptions in some ways that they don't qualify, have the same knowledge giving qualities as sense perceptions. One of the main reasons is outward sense perceptions of objects like this pen can be verified by others, whereas inward experiences cannot be. So that's one. Okay, yeah, you had an inner experience. Sure, it's very similar to an outward experience, but it isn't open to independent confirmation from somebody else. And then he says, um, so, and one of, so that is, then he gives the example of the president of Tajikistan. You can see the president of Tajikistan at a party, but that, that doesn't mean you knew it was the president. Just because you had an experience of that person doesn't mean you had an experience of that person as the president of a country. And similarly, you might experience God, but how would you know it was an experience of God as God himself, defined as the omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, all good creator of the world? Did your experience of an uplifting moment from God, casting away the sh shadows of doubt and sadness, does that qualify as the omnipotent creator of the world? So, um, what is it about your experience that, that proves to you it was God who created it? And so, again, I'm saying these near-death experiences, it's exactly what people say they experienced. God, as the creator of the cosmos, is the origin of the cosmos, specifically perceived as a light at the end of a dark tunnel at the edge of the cosmos, which is what current cosmology tells us you would perceive if you could travel through space at close to the speed of light, you would see the singularity, the origin of the cosmos at the end of a dark tunnel, at the edge of the cosmos, at the horizon of the cosmos where space-time is expanding at the speed of light. So I would bring in near-death experiences and psychedelic experiences, which he goes on to talk about. Okay, so a second, this is the bottom of page 46, and in my view, more serious objection to the view that religious experiences might qualify as perceptual concerns, the fact that perceptions involve a kind of causal sensitivity. God is not spatially located, he points out, and so therefore can't cause you to have... How, how can a non-spatially located being cause you to experience things? Where's the point of contact? And then he'll go out... And I would immediately bring in, well, God is not spatially located, Near is, neither is the gravitational singularity. It's defined as a point of infinite gravity and zero volume, zero extension in space. And then he goes on to bring in the idea of the Big Bang itself. He says, yeah, the Big Bang is the cause of everything, but you can't experience the Big Bang itself. So even if you accept God as the causal ground of everything, does that mean you can experience God directly? Uh, and I'd say, well... You can experience the Big Bang, at least you can see its effect, the cosmic microwave background radiation, and you can perceive non-spatially located singularities. You can't perceive them directly, but you can know they exist inside black holes because of their effect. Whole stars orbit black holes, it's proving that they exist. So there are ways that you can infer the existence of a non-spatially located, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent entity called the singularity, I would apply those same kinds of criteria to the evidence for God's existence. Or at least I, I did bring that in, in a book, Psyche and Singularity. Okay, so the bottom of 47, let us assume, if only for the sake of argument, that religious experiences qualify as perceptual states, might they inherit the epistemic status of perceptual states and thus justify belief in the same way that ex perceptual experiences can. And he gives three reasons why you shouldn't accept them. Yeah, you did experience God. Or you experienced a religious experience, but does that give you a good reason to trust that it was from God? You did experience something. Was it God? How could you prove that? So the first reason concerns experiences of God's absence. We went over that. 
oh, you experienced God? That proves God exists. I didn't experience God. That proves God doesn't exist. So Tim Bain rejects that. You see your friend in the crowd? That proves she was there. You don't see her? That doesn't prove she's not there. There might be so many people that you never get to see her. The second reason at the bottom of 48 to deny that religious experiences have the same epistemic status as ordinary perceptual experiences involves the claim that the epistemic status of perception depends on a grasp of the conditions under which perceptual experiences are trustworthy. What are the conditions for a trustworthy religious experience? The conditions for a trustworthy visual experience are sufficient light, a well-rested eyes. What are the conditions for a religious experience? Well, you might say purity of, of habits, a life of prayer, but then he brings in the idea of psychedelic drugs, does a religious experience induced by psychedelic drugs, is it, are those conditions valid for saying yes, they were true experiences, or, or does it invalidate the experience I brought in the example of Stanislav Grof, the last licensed psychiatrist to give people psychedelic drugs before that was recently re-legalized in certain situations, and he said, that psychedelics are like a telescope into the soul. You can, it's more trustworthy in some respects because the conditions for spiritual experiences are severe, according to the religions, a life of prayer and fasting and abstinence. Whereas you can get the same effect almost instantly through these psychedelic drugs, at least a glimpse of these kinds of experiences. The difference being that they tend to fade when the drug wears off, although the after effects continue, according to Stanislav Grof. Um, so I'll read this again. The fundamental problem here is that our ability to, to distinguish trustworthy experiences from untrustworthy ones depends on our capacity to locate experiences within the causal structure of the world. What's the causal structure of the world? I don't know what he's talking about. He brings in himself the idea of quantum mechanics which imply the existence of uncaused events, spontaneous events happening. The causal structure of the world according to string theory is that the past, the present, and the future are condensed in the central point, the singularity of the Big Bang, which exists at every point of the horizon of the cosmos, the outermost sphere of the universe, where space-time is expanding at light speed, then all that information radiates back in to create the holographic illusion of three-dimensional objects that casts this, these holograms in on these fundamental elastic threads. So that's the causal structure of the world according to the string theory, which unites general relativity and quantum mechanics. That causal structure of the universe is extremely similar to religions, religions of the world, which say the same thing. Plato said it. The Upanishads of Hinduism say it. St. Augustine following Plato says it in the Confessions. He called it the heaven of heavens. The past, the present, and future coexist at the outermost sphere, and they radiate in to create this material world. So if that's the causal structure of the world, then religious experiences, like near-death experiences, where people feel themselves hurtling out towards that horizon of the cosmos through a dark tunnel, it seems to me become a lot more believable. And that the idea of a material world made of little bits of matter enduring independently, whether you're observing them or not, existing in three dimensions of space, enduring through linear time, that is not believable anymore. That has not that has been disproven, and yet it seems that Tim Bain is switching from appealing to general relativity and quantum mechanics sometimes, but then he falls back into the Newtonian framework of three dimensions of space, linear time, laws of cause and effect, forcing these little bits of matter to interact. That is the theory upon which Darwinism is based. It has been undermined thrice, thricely, three times in the 20th century. Relativity theory, quantum mechanics, and string theory. So it would be nice to see maybe another edition of this book by Tim Bain if he brings in some of that evidence. Okay, so let us consider one final challenge to the argument from religious experience at the bottom of 49, and that is the, the challenge from religious pluralism. How come no two religions absolutely agree? If these religious experiences are genuine, wouldn't people from different religions in the world experience the same thing? If it's a real spiritual world, why are you getting all these different perceptions of it? 
if if I hold this up and some say, oh yeah, you're you're holding up a toaster. Oh, it's a loaf of bread. Oh, it's well then now you have, you've got good reason to doubt what it is I'm holding up. Is it something real or not? Oh, what is God? God's a personal being who exists at the outermost cosmos, the sphere of the cosmos, or God is an impersonal absolute energy who permeates everything. Religions can have both. Hinduism, for example, has the idea of Atman and Brahman. Atman is the individual personal soul. Brahman is the impersonal waves of precognitive bliss. It's very similar to the particle wave paradox of quantum mechanics. But at any rate, I've gone over them twice, the different objections to the idea of proving God exists based on religious experiences. So which of the objections to William Alston's position do you find stronger and which do you find weaker? I have given you enough, I think, to answer that question.